Ah, another draft physics video presentation. Um, I think I'll go through some more polarization stuff and maybe play some Professor Lewin uh, to re-emphasize some points that just aren't dealt with by conventional physics. They just don't talk about these important distinctions and facts. So first, even the word polarization is just a mess. Okay, because they're using it for so many different kinds of difference between two things and so um, the orientation of an antenna is one kind of polarization um, the admitter and the receiver um, then there's this idea that the photons themselves whatever you think they are uh, carry some polarization information in some form um, then you have the poles of a magnet um, and there's probably something else. <laughs> so anyway, too many things, too many concepts having the same word. It's not a good idea. So we're already in a little bit of trouble because of that. Um, so, but they really just don't talk about these elemental things. So we have this idea of waves versus particles. The real argument is waves versus rays, I would argue. Um, because it really doesn't matter whether you call these tiny, tiny things that carry momentum a particle or not. It just doesn't matter. The point is, is that it's a clump. It's a little bit. That's the thing. So it's bit versus wave, or you know, however. And again, these, I, you know, I can just all I can do is draw it and just say, how does this make any sense? Where's the consistency? So their standard drawing is this idea that somehow there's a photon has a magnetic element and an electric element and they're in you know perpendicular planes of different dimensions. So this dimension versus this dimension. Um, it's how they know to be in those dimensions, who knows? <laughs> so or or to affect things in those dimensions. Um, you know what this is some sort of it's some sort of compression they say okay it's some sort of this to this or something so it, it's some expanding thing it expands some field thing and it does it in some kind of way where it's going everywhere but it only lands in one place uh you know i can't tie those loose ends together so i'm sorry if i'm not I'm not being fair to their argument, but I, I can't describe their argument. Their argument is, is that this, this thing travels through space making some sort of compression in one direction and then a, another compression in the other direction and then a compression in some direction. Well, they're supposed to be both in line, so it's compressing a field going this way and it's compressing a field going this way as it moves this way. <laughs> yeah. And there's no evidence of any compression moving this way, so we don't have any evidence that there's anything electrical or magnetic in a photon. I mean, just no zero evidence that there is any such compressioning happening. All we have evidence of is a thing moving the speed of light in a straight line and landing in a discrete location. That's all we have evidence of. But again, I can't, I can't make any sense out of how whatever this compression that has no evidence moving through space at the speed of light is the same as this that this is this I can't, I can't make that connection I can't turn this into anything I know of as a wave as Feynman says it doesn't spread <laughs> it doesn't do any of this stuff um, you know that is classical of what we have defined the word wave to mean and there's every indication that it's a ray of light. That so they draw this. So I, I, let's just concede. My my only change to this drawing is is that yeah I'm just saying they're clumps. Okay, all right. They're not perturbating anything. They're they're a clump. It's a clump that moves. And when you have a string of them at a frequency, bullets. All right, that's all there is. There's just bullets at a frequency, clumps of momentum, asteroids coming at a frequency. And when they come at a frequency, they can cause things that they couldn't cause if they weren't at a frequency. 
because it matters. Timing is everything. <laughs> we even have phrases like that. Timing is everything. Not in physics. <laughs> you know, not the way they teach it. All right, well, the, cl the key thing missing in all their descriptions of this is length. What, what, are you to put, what is this? What, what, what is the L here? What is this? Is this a photon? All I need is this? Or do I need this much? Or do I need this much? Is there any description by them of how this thing, um, how, how it could be quantized as a clump of energy, and yet it's completely ambiguous as to whether there can be this much of it, or this much of it, or this much of it. And obviously that's a different amount of energy, you would argue. The, the more of these little humpy things that come at you, that's a different amount of energy. So how do they account for that? They don't. There's just no conversation. So I would argue that that's a huge flaw. That's just kind of obvious in their theory that something so fundamental isn't even dealt with. They don't even... I haven't seen a single physics video that ever described the length of this thing. They just draw it and say, there, photon. <laughs> you know... What do you mean, photon? This much, that much, this much? Nothing. Absolute zero. Nothing. I can't find a single... I have not in my whole life seen a single physicist deal with the length of this thing. Because once they do, they're going to have to make some sort of concessions that there's a certain amount of energy that arrives. And that certain amount of energy, what it does, doesn't have anything to do with this thing here. It has everything to do with what it hits. <laughs> it has to do with what the receiver is doing. It doesn't have anything to do with what this photon is doing. If you want a different result, make it hit something different. Hit something in a different condition and you'll get a different outcome. But this thing doesn't do anything. Anyway, <clears throat> so that's about all I can say on the subject. I'm arguing that photon polarization just means, you know, where they're arguing that somehow these magnetic and electric waves get out of phase or some other kind of Thing happens and that's your polarization. I bet I can't describe their theory because I don't understand it. Um, you know, that it depends on what plane you're in. So this was up and down now. And then up and down is this way for the electric field, let's say. So that's the polarization. Is the wave is compressing in this dimension for whatever reason. Um, and that's its polarization. Where I'm arguing, you know, its polarization is, is the little clumps are a little bit out of alignment and they can be out of alignment in all the two dimensions perpendicular to the motion. So in the two dimensions perpendicular to the motion they can be a little bit off this perfect straight line and that's polarization. So light that has mixed polarization means that each photon has elements that are not only a little bit off this way it has elements a little bit off this way and a little bit off this way and a little bit you know any one of the dimensions and polarizing filters are just scraping the the biggest offenders <coughs> out of the ray, which is essentially just erasing part of the frequency. You know, this guy doesn't make it. I lost my frequency. It's that simple. All right. <coughs> um, all right. So phase. So that's a you know another really important subject. Um, the frequency, everything is frequency dependent uh, in terms of, let's say you were going to, you know, in the example of Professor Lewin, create a reflection, you're going to bounce this off of something. The key thing to, for this frequency is if this bounces off when, <coughs> if the timing of this isn't just the right distance, then this will end up, the return stroke will be out of phase. and. Uh, you know, and then if it bounces back again, it's going to be a, off another phase. It's going to be a whole different phase. So you, you got you no know, resonance there. So that's the idea of resonance is having exactly the right distance between your emitter and your transmitter. That this is, ends up this this U turn ends up being a, a complete cycle, and you end up with a clump here, and then you have something called a standing wave because they just keep reinforcing each other. Okay, they keep ending up in exactly the same location. These are the ones I should have X'd. Not this little jerk. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> so the energy would just keep 
piling on at exactly the same location in space, so to speak, and that would be what you would call a standing wave. But you only create standing waves at specific s frequencies at specific distances. So this becomes very important. So, like in a radar experiment, you could be shooting radar. Radar loves to reflect off surfaces. So you have your gun shooting the stuff, and it loves to bounce off everything, you know, all over the place. That's why they use it to detect things, is because it's very good at bouncing off of stuff. Um, and so if I uh, attempt to do something to the radar, you know, create some sort of um, pattern by putting something in the way, <clears throat> the trick is I have to be aware of the fact that there's going to be reflections from the transmitter. There's going to be reflections off surfaces, and so there's going to be a lot of bouncing. And so depending on where I put my receiver, I'm going to get all kinds of um, reflected signal. Um, and <clears throat> I can't be sure. And then what I'm going to find out is that those reflections are going to be like this closed container. Then once I create a f reflection path, you know, let's just create a path for a reflection. <clears throat> you know, let's say there's a this a ceiling it comes back this way and hits your detector. So you're shooting it this way. But what you're going to end up doing is also detecting it off of reflections. And reflections would have, the key to reflections is that they <clears throat> would have, they could be just on phase, which means that the reflection off the earth that goes back to the source, okay, um, <clears throat> is in <clears throat> the right length to create a standing wave. So you could have specific locations where you have a signal and you have no signal, and then you have a signal and you have no signal, based on how you're receiving it again. If you're receiving it as pure energy, it can't matter. But if you're tuning to it, well, that's a whole different subject. I guess I have to put tuning on here, so that's something I have to add. I think I have transmission detection, methods of detection, yeah, so that's about the same thing. Um, and to understand the difference between how, you know, what you're detecting. Is it raw energy, or are you detecting through a whole electronic processing of a signal um, versus just detecting like our eyeballs do um, based on an amount of energy uh, hitting uh, a location in our retina. All right, um, so the example of spring compression. So this is the electron argument, and I'll, I'll make it another way without using a spring. Um, so you have the um, concept of the electron and the proton which is a pretty reliable bit of stuff, the idea of them, uh, you know, positive charge and negative charge, and we know the implications of that. And the idea is there's electrons. I could just use one, but let's just use there's more than one electron. Uh, one of them's right in the glare. And the idea is this energy, you're going to put energy in. Okay, you're going to hit it with one of these things. And the idea is, is that you're not going to hit it once. You're going to hit it more than once. Okay. <laughs> You're going to hit it with a ray, okay, an array of photons. So the point is, is you're pushing energy in, okay. Let's just say I'm pushing energy into this electron, which is going to move it closer to this electron, which is going to move it this electron closer to this electron kind of argument. <clears throat> Especially if I'm pushing in this way. Let me just put it in that way. Um, I'd be pushing these electrons. I'd end up getting closer to them. And that means I'm pushing pressure on them while I'm putting pressure in. And so the whole idea is the electrons have a certain balance with their proton. So they balance their location. And um, so when you change this one, you change this one, you change that one. It's a simple argument. And the idea would be is that when you're pumping energy in, you're displacing the electron, specifically the one you hit probably, okay? <laughs> So because these can't react fast enough, especially at this high frequency. So that's the whole idea of why high frequencies work, is because the pressure can't be equalized in time. So the idea is you're pre pushing this electron into a location or out of a location. So I guess, the, yeah, I guess this would be the better example. If you push this electron away from the proton, okay, so I hit it with one of these, and I push it away from the electron. So I hit it, and I hit it, and I hit it, and I hit it. And I hit it fast enough, okay, this high frequency light stuff, 
you know, just tiny nanometers of distance and, you know, um, what do you call it? how many milliseconds is that? Well, anyway, very fast. Um, and so, uh, and the idea is going to be for the for the reaction of the electron, the one you're looking for. So when you pump the energy in, the idea is pushing it far enough away where when the electron goes back, because it's attracted to the proton, it goes back in stages, okay, that will create a, a clump of this stuff exactly like this, okay, a, a compression, okay, uh, for each stage it's making a transfer as it goes back. And I've sort of explained the whole transferring thing, you know, electrons, electrons consume this stuff, you know, they give back something, but they, what changes is their internal structure, so they, you know, if they had stuff going this way, rowers, they end up changing the proportion, you know, so instead of two to three, they end up with three and two, which means they move in the opposite direction. And the point is, is they're going to do that <coughs> a few times to get back to the proton. So just as the energy came in clumps and pushed it out, when it goes back, it's going to clump energy back into the universe. Um, all right, so I didn't really want to get into that much depth of the theory. Um, but I just wanted to point out that what's the, the real idea is, is that you're just going to have a spring, you know, the electrons on it, that's the tension with the, the, the proton, and the idea is, is if you want to compress the spring deep, the deeper you go, is this is where a new photon will be created if you get this deep, and you can only get that deep if you hit it fast enough so it doesn't rebound. You have to go, you have to hit it with energy quickly enough so it doesn't have time for the spring to fight back. And that's the only way you can get deep enough to release the photon, the, to have the event that we record as electric current or whatever we record. All right. So, <coughs> next, um, so methods of detection. So they're different, okay, causing, um, a, a photon, to, a new photon to be admitted, okay, um, a piece of energy, or causing a, an electron cascade, like with a photo detector, what they basically do is they put a whole bunch of electrons in almost a, um, you know, where they're going to exit their atom, they're so excited. So you heat these electrons, you know, these atoms, get the electrons really excited uh, in the sense that they're pushing their envelope, so they're really easy to kick out and <clears throat> by moving the electrons you know so you hit one electron one electron bangs into another electron it knocks two electrons free let's say and then so on and so on it's more like five to one so each electron that hits another electron ends up that electron ends up hitting five more electrons and you have a cascade of these electrons ionizing and um, you know, we measure that as a voltage and say we have something hit it. So the other things, the other detectors are detecting things in much different ways. So in some of this, this frequency stuff is, so radio is very different in how we detect it. We detect light based on that compression argument. The light has to actually move an electron a substantial distance, some real distance from, you know, from the proton for us to get a current. Um, but in radio, we're creating uh, an artificial, again, an artificial circumstance where we're c creating a competing, the you know, uh, frequency and <coughs> um, using that to, um, I don't know how to say, compare to the energy coming in. And if they're on phase, that is, if the, if the, if the frequency we create matches the frequency there, there's one of the ones hitting the antenna, the two will, in the oscillator, uh, reflect. Uh, they'll be at the right resonance. And so they'll keep reflecting back and forth and amplify the amount of energy we see. So it's detecting a different phenomenon. It's not detecting ionization. It's not detecting something that's dramatic, it's just detecting a wobble in the electron. And you're just setting up another wobble that's very similar and basically saying 
can you add energy to this system with your vibration? Is your vibration going to constructively, okay, like when this thing's moving this way, you throw in something going this way. And when it's coming this way, you don't throw anything. And then when it's going this way again, you throw something in. So you're always throwing energy in, in the direction, one direction of motion. Uh, and you're never, you're never throwing energy in at the time it's going this way. So you're never, you're never annihilating the imbalance. You keep adding to the imbalance. Uh, so you have a constructive addition of energy. <clears throat> I mean, it's unfortunate they use words like uh, destructive and constructive interference. So it's really not interference. <laughs> it's, it's, it's adding energy to a system or subtracting energy from the system. And energy is the imbalance. So the more imbalance you have, the more energy you have. And so you're trying to add to the imbalance. That is, add to the, uh, you know, to one side or the other, but you're adding to the creation of imbalance. All right. Um, okay, there's probably enough on that. So you just have to understand that <clears throat> photon isn't photon is a photon. They're all the same, the photons. The only thing that's different about them is this difference of, you know, how far apart they are. You know, uh, red light is almost twice as far apart as blue light. So if that was blue, this would be, red would be, you know, almost twice as much. These damn pens are such a bitch. Stay. <clears throat> um, that's better. Um, so, you, you know, it's just, a, it's just frequency dependent. Um, and, uh, you know, nothing miraculous about the idea that you would say, this has more energy. Well, obviously, because there's more density of clumps per time or distance. I mean, obviously, there's more volume, so to speak. But there's nothing fundamentally different between this photon and this photon. The difference is, is what effect they can have in a world full of things you can tip over, you know, that have tipping points. So it matters, frequency, in a world where everything is tippable. How much, you know, if everything's wobbling on the floor, you know there's certain bounce rates. You know, you could bounce the floor at certain rates that are going to cause everything to fall over. And you could bounce at another rate, and everything would just, nah, it just could never get going enough to fall over. I mean, this is something we all have personal experience with, so, but it's never discussed, really, in those terms. <clears throat> in the, the, the terms of the, the, plethora and the ton of evidence of how important that the reaction is of the system, not what a photon is doing. You know, they'd want to blame everything on a, some function of this simple thing, when what's happening in the world is, is this simple thing, this kind of generic elemental thing, is interacting with very different uh, physical objects. Those different objects will detect this in different ways. All right, heat, uh, dissipation, and equilibrium. So this is the real interesting part. Uh, to you know, just because it's something I I observed years ago with with um, I mean you know if you shoot a laser beam through um, a, a piece of plastic, um, <clears throat> you can melt it. You know, even when it looks transparent. Um, you know, and if it has anything, any pigment on it or something, it's really easy to melt. It's really easy to melt, say, the uh, photography film, you know, uh, movie films. You know, if, if the film breaks and the frame stays in front of the light, it gets melted. Um, it's really easy to do. Um, just, you know, burn it with light. And polarizing films, though, don't seem to melt that easy. They don't absorb energy all that much. So that's something I, you know, I saw in the past and I sort of noticed if it's blocking half the light, it should get warm. It should, should be some evidence that it's absorbed that light. And I just didn't realize that it's not really absorbing it. It's just making the light less visible. So, you know, these, this light just goes in, and say, a frequency, and it comes out because of this polarization fact, the fact that some of these are out of alignment. It comes out 
still as energy. It's just that one piece of the energy has its phase shifted. That means it's lost its correct location. So it's still here. It's just here, you know, where it's not supposed to be. And so this frequency is not going to be detectable. It's not enough of a photon. Um, but the energy is still there. So what goes into the filter is six little bits of stuff. And what comes out is six little bits of stuff. But they're in a different arrangement in the sense that they're their frequency that was perfect has been turned into something broken, messed up, and so you can't detect this photon, and you can detect this one, and that's all that's really happened. You've just changed the photon into something undetectable. Um, you haven't um, destroyed its energy, and it's true that you could stick another filter in it, 45 degrees, and fix that broken one, turn it back into this back into something you can see and that's the nature of polarization filters for light where <clears throat> in the case of radio waves or some other thing you're uh, detecting the polarization of first you have to make sure you're not being fooled by antenna polarization uh, that's the next subject the two different fundamentally different kinds of polarization one has to do with the, a group effect what's happening to a group of photons and the other has to do with, you know, and how, many vo how much volume of that group can you detect when it was shot this way and you're trying to detect it on an antenna going this way. <laughs> well, you're only going to detect this band, you know, the 180 degrees of this one plane. And uh, you're going to miss all of this, 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 this. You're not going to get any of that. Or if you have the antenna this way, you'll get all of this radiation. Uh, that's denser than the circumference radiation. The circumference is small, the length is long. Uh, big difference in the volume that you can collect. So I'm jumping ahead. So back to uh, heat dissipation. Uh, so yeah, so that's really kind of the um, thing to look for is the stuff should get hot. If, the, if you use a metal um, conductor as a filter, um, then you should notice that if it's going to conduct electricity, it's going to get hot. There's going to be some heat in the conductors. Uh, and <coughs> I think that does happen. So in the case of uh, radio, I don't think you can actually do the um, repair job, okay, because what you're doing is you're actually hitting, you're, you're scraping off these photons that are out of alignment. And when you scrape them off, they actually do go into the antenna. And so you <coughs> lose that one. Um, it can't go this way at any rate. Okay? It's not going to, it's not going to go forward. Um, probably not. Uh, but it's certainly not going to go forward at the same phase because it went through this antenna. So you could understand that the phase argument still could be true in the sense that it goes into the metal, polarizes the atoms, which causes the flow of electricity, um, but it also comes back out. But obviously going through the antenna would slow you down because going through any medium slows light down. So it slows, it changes the speed from C to something else. The speed doesn't really change, and as I've argued, it's just the path of the light changes. But clearly, you're going to break the phase. So we're back to the importance of the phase argument. Phase is broken, even even if this metal retransmits whatever hits it. It's not going to matter because it's so broke. It broke the phase so substantially that there's no hope of getting that photon back to the right position in the formation. The pattern's been broken, and then you can't fix it. Where in light, it's only been broken by a, a single half phase. All you've done is do a small shift in the phase. You haven't done a catastrophic shift in the phase. Okay. Probably enough on that. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um... All right, antenna polarization in the f uh, f 
uh, versus photon. So the idea is the photon has a kind of polarization, and these photons, a bunch of that stuff would be coming off of an antenna, and the idea is the antenna has an orientation. It's throwing the stuff disproportionately. The amount of spread this way is much higher than the spread this way. So it's much denser coming out this way than it is this way. So if you're going to try to receive it, you're going to receive a lot more of it by being in the same orientation as the antenna. So that's antenna polarization. And it's going to look like this kind of polarization in a lot of ways, but it just looks like. It isn't is like. It's fundamentally different. So in light, all we really deal with usually is, um, we don't bother with antenna polarization, but you can understand how it would be pretty easy to do the experiment by just putting a fluorescent tube in line, and then you could figure out that you're going to detect more of the light if you turn your detector in the same orientation as the light is in. You know, just an obvious kind of thing. Uh, Okay, absorption versus retransmission. So this is, you know, one of the key questions is, you know, uh, the energy is going in a direction when it hits something. I, I sort of would argue that you don't really change the direction by creating electricity, but in some respects I suppose you must think you do. But the idea is, is that the energy was going this way. All you've really done is made atoms fat okay by hitting them with energy they communicate with each other and move that fatness this way um, as electricity and so that's probably the end of the cycle okay so if this is the electron the energy goes into the electron there is a reflection back to the source which you, we can never see because we're never a source of energy so obviously we can't see something coming back into our eyes because our eyes don't shoot radar and then receive radar. Our eyes don't shoot light and then see the light they shot. But that's always there. Um, and the electron has a momentum it gets from that. Um, and the question is, is that for that, for this atom now, if I call this a whole atom, it's going to exchange pressure this way, that is this one's big, this one's small, and they're going to both equalize, so this one's going to get bigger, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, that's not going to work, all right, we'll just go back this way, um, you know, <clears throat> so this one's going to get a little smaller, and this one's going to get a little bigger, so just pretend this is bigger than that, uh, right in the pen. anyway, um, so they're going to equalize to each other's pressure and that means that this one's going to be next to one that's somewhat smaller than it so these two are going to equalize and so on and so on and so on so the energy moves perpendicular okay to the direction that it entered I don't think it has to be obviously perpendicular I think it could come in this way or any way but it doesn't really matter um, but the idea is, is that that sort of completes the cycle, is that you have motion this way, and that's converted into motion of the atoms in terms of a change in their pressure going this way, and that kind of finishes it, and there's no real room to retransmit. Um, but as the channel's defined, I'm a little drafty on that. <laughs> okay, I have to, I have to think about it, because this exchange isn't really cost anything. One thing gets bigger, one thing gets smaller. Yeah. But um yeah, I'd have to I just haven't gone through all the permutations on that one yet. So we'll leave that an open question. I could have put a question mark. Absorption versus retransmission question mark. What's the nature of absorption? If it's going to absorb it see everything reaches, that's the other heat argument. You know, everything has a, an equilibrium, so to speak, because you can't keep just pumping heat in unless you're making something hotter and hotter and hotter. If something's at the same temperature, then you know whatever energy's going in, it's got to come out somewhere. It's, you know, what goes in comes out. It's, it's, you're just looking for where it's going. You know, you're trying to follow it. And if you follow it strictly as movement, well, you could argue you can see it in the sense of 
the fact that um, you can see the effect of the energy in the sense that something's moving inside the light filament. It doesn't have to be moving in a direction, it just has to be vibrating. So, so you're causing stuff to move. So um, you've taken movement that went in a source miles away and the movement goes through the wire and then the movement comes out the light bulb but it, all the movement can be is just you're changing something that was moving like this into something that's moving like this you know a lot more uh, same same speed bigger distances that kind of thing however you want to describe it um, more pressure so you could say smaller distances create higher vibrations anyway um, in a different form. So yes, so the retransmission in a different form, um, <clears throat> which means it can create different kinds of photons. So you could put a light photon in, and you could get infrared out. You know, something a higher frequency out, just because you've changed the phase. Changing phase essentially means changing the frequency. Often, <clears throat> I mean, if I change the phase of one of these nodes and put it a little bit off phase, I've created a higher frequency here. So if I do it more than once. I can change this big frequency into a smaller frequency just by messing up the phase. <clears throat> um, but that takes time. So you always have to consume a little bit of time to do this conversion from, from this frequency to this frequency would take a little bit of time. Or vice versa, going the opposite way, you'd consume time to do that. All right, so that's probably enough of that. And so um, let's play a Professor Lewin experiment, and I'll point out how, you know, a lot of his experiments I think are quite good, um, but some of them are in over-engineered, and I would say um, to to make it look like, you know, okay, to make to take something that isn't like and make it seem like. <laughs> and um, I'd say this is another example. So I'd say his example of the radar experiment is a, a rig um, by putting the tone on it uh, and by um, uh, <coughs> uh, not recognizing that the exact same phenomenon could be blamed on jamming, signal jamming, because your detector can't detect two out of phase of the same signal, the same frequency, hitting it at the same intensity. If the two signals are out of phase, it can't detect either one. All right. Uh, so, uh, and you know, it's just jamming. It's not. You don't need wave interference for that. All right. So, off to the video. All right. So he's just gone through Maxwell's equations, trying to point out how, as I pointed out before, that there's this. Uh, resonance argument. Maxwell's equation is basically arguing in this closed loop of a plane of you know, shooting your EM. Anyway, that there's somehow it's a standing wave being created. And as I sort of pointed out, true of instru you know, musical instruments, anything, the resonance is completely frequency dependent. So you have to have the right frequency and the right distance to create a constructive standing wave. Um, uh, it might be perfectly destructive, actually, a standing wave. But anyway, it doesn't. You know, don't really want to get into. You know, the point is, is it's very frequency dependent. And so the sum of the incoming wave and the reflecting wave must be zero here. So I don't want to see that light at all. Right. So he's using, uh, uh, like I said, Maxwell's equations to say that somehow. Um, let's see how to put it. Uh, no, I can't. I, there's no way to put it. I just explain where he says something, and I'll say that's a misinterpretation of what just happened. And then I will walk out in the lecture hall and see whether there are locations in the lecture hall where we actually receive electromagnetic radiation. We will see the light, and where we will not. See. Right, and all of those are going to be manufactured by reflected light. So. You know, he even points out how he doesn't, he hasn't calculated the reflections in the room. So he's basically saying that he's turned the radio wave by being in a certain position. He's created a certain distance from the antenna. The antenna, the 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 frequency is going to be 88 kilohertz, 
which was three meters, three point something meters. So every three meters there would be a node, uh, you know, where the the reflected beam and the um, the emitting beam are both at the same exact location in a specific time. So at a specific time, they'd both be one would be going this way, one would be going that way, and they would create a standing node. Um, obviously, that would be very frequency dependent, and the distances would have to be consistent. It would also mean that the first wave, that is the first three meters, you shouldn't get any signal till you get three meters away. There shouldn't be any signal detectable until you get to three meters. And the obvious truth is, no, you can pick up plenty of radio from an inch away, two inches, two feet, five feet. You know, three meters is uh, nine feet. Uh, whatever, <laughs> if it was a yard, um, whatever it is, eight feet, um, you know, that would be where you should start to get a signal then if it was a standing wave. So this has nothing to do with standing waves. There's no standing wave. The light. So, make sure that this is not too close to the transmitter because otherwise we will load it. All right, so I the transmitter looks a little bit complicated, frankly. Um, but the receiver, he says, this is what it is. Um, and I think the transmitter is doing the same thing, frankly. Um, so it's just two antennas. And they are grounded, essentially, through a light bulb filament. Okay, like that. And so the potentials of these two antennas you would sort of argue because these pieces of metal are a certain distance from each other this one's going to be the opposite of this one you know in its polarization uh, you know just because it's metal and that's what metal things do and so this one's going to tend to get a higher potential as the radiation hits this one it's going to increase the positive here and as the as the energy hits this antenna it's going to increase the positive here you know so the negative is decreasing I'm just saying so this is going to go you know this potential goes down this potential goes up creating a voltage that goes through this filament it's the basic idea uh, the transmitter is some kind of looks a little loopy but it has two antennas okay so it's sending the signal also in two hunks of antenna not in one static antenna so I think you could do the experiment just as well by having a straight antenna putting the energy in one end <laughs> as a transmitter and then do the same thing with the receiver just take one end of this antenna to ground uh, you know to ground and um, you could do the same thing but this is their technology of choice just for those who are smart enough to understand how this makes a difference. I just thought I would try to be accurate to what hardware is being used. Oh. So let me first show you then that when I stand here that I'm receiving this electromagnetic radiation. Right. Now if he stood two feet away he's going to receive even more of it and one foot away he's going to receive even more of it. So there's absolutely no phase dependency in here at all. And if this was phase dependent, that is if all the energy was in certain nodes, certain locations, then as he went closer, he should get no signal. So there is no location specific nodes in space here at all. There's no standing waves going back and forth and doing any of that stuff. It just easily can't be the right answer. But it's what he's asserting. Remember that the E field is for So you can see it got brighter as he moved it forward. There, there's no there's no phase here somewhere where you have to be on phase. There's no distance that says, okay, that's where the energy is. Nothing like that. Proportional to the sign of theta. And so I'm here in an, in an excellent position so I get a maximum electric field. You get even more if you move half the distance. You'll get even more. Uh, you know, you'll burn your light bulb out maybe. If I rotate it like this, 
Right. So that's just antenna polarization as a point. It has nothing to do with what the photons themselves, their polarization. It just, you know, which way they're moving in a magnetic field or an electric field. So you can believe in the wacky bullshit. This antenna polarization has nothing to do with the what what dimension, okay, the magnetic field is being wobbled in. It has nothing to do with the photons polarization. There's nothing, and that has to do with the polarization. There's nothing to do with standing waves. And this, your, this whole, ex this whole demonstration has nothing to do with standing waves. It really doesn't. The polarization. But now look. I claim that there must be here a nodal surface. There's no electric field. All right. So the claim is, is that if you put a, uh, a an infinite plane, right? conductor on the end of say you know this field. so if you put an infinite plane conductor a piece of metal that was an infinite conductor it would conduct all the energy away right I mean there's no there's no energy that could be coming off of it no field no nothing because all of it got conducted away um, so it can't push any back in terms of it can't have any thermal equilibrium it can't it can't have any out path because it's an infinite plane that absorbs everything um, and so he's kind of claiming that's what the blackboard is in practical sense it's a big huge piece of metal behind the board this big huge piece of metal is now creating a, a, a place where you can't bounce any waves off of it so you can't create any nodes now he just showed a node he just pretended he had a node in front of it so that doesn't make any sense there's no node so this is so watch and learn okay so the light goes out so when you go close to a big piece of metal you're saying well why does it go out I mean okay we haven't done anything to the signal so this is why they can this is how they confuse things right <laughs> um, all right so it's basically you have this piece of metal here all right and you're shooting these photons at this big huge conductor and this is supposed to be really big Okay, it's big. Um, and the idea is there's zero here. There's zero EMF. There's zero energy coming off of this huge thing. So the antenna can't pick up anything off of this, of course. But you still ask, well, why doesn't the antenna, uh, you know, he has, it, he has it pointed this way. Let's just, just for illustration purposes, let's just put the antenna this way and pretend the antenna was this way to start the experiment. Um, you know, just to make it easier to draw. So you're still saying, well, why doesn't this antenna pick up the energy? It's in front of this. It's, you know, it should be collecting all kinds of energy. No matter how close it gets to this, it's still in front of it, right? It's, it's here. The thing that's supposed to be zero is here. Um, so this should still be, be hit by a ton of energy. So why isn't it registering any energy? Well, the problem is, is when he puts it close to this big giant conductor, this thing essentially becomes electrostatically connected to this thing so it essentially loses its it becomes polarized the antenna ends up being energized essentially to the energy of this because if you're bringing it so close so when you're bringing something close to something it essentially becomes part of it so if the moon was three feet off the earth you'd consider it part of the gravity of the earth <laughs> okay it'd be so close um, and essentially that's what you're doing to the antenna so you're you're neutralizing the antenna because it's now communicating its electron pressure okay with this piece of metal now if you did this experiment in a vacuum it, it would be a little more interesting to see if it matters um, because you wouldn't be conducting it out but the point is is the energy is going into the antenna and because this is so close this is pulling the energy out of the antenna so instead of lighting the bulb, the potential of this is being drained into this conductor. So you're losing it in this infinite plane. And that's why the bulb won't light. It's not that the antenna is not getting hit a lot. It's that it doesn't have the same drain. The drain isn't through the filament anymore. The drain is into the big conductor it's next to. 
it's electrostatically been made uh, inert. Maybe that's a right technical term. Not amazing. This is a standing wave that I'm building up. Right. I'm now in that surface that I pointed out here on the blackboard. <clears throat> yeah, so all you've done is connect two metal things by putting them into proximity. And that is what they're going to do. They're going to charge. You're changing its charge potential. Obviously, the whole way you're detecting the signal is by creating a difference in its charge potential, a voltage. And you can't do that if you're charging the antenna. So if you're putting energy into the antenna or changing its energy, you can't pick up vibrations in its energy. It's getting dampened by the huge conductor you put next to it. And that conductor is pulling all the dampening out. There can't be any, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's dampening the signal. Now I can also try to walk through the audience and see whether there are locations where I see light. You could hear a little bit of the, this. So let's also understand that in this experiment, that transmitter is blaringly loud. Okay, I mean, it's, they have it cranked up. They're putting real voltage into it, real amps, okay, to create enough energy to be able to light this bulb. So it's a ton of energy. So all the Tesla nuts understand that this is a very inefficient way of transferring energy. Okay, there's a, there's, you know, um, let's say 2,000 watts going in and you're getting out 2 watts. It's that bad. Just to, and like so, you know, all these people who are charging their iPods on these little magnetic things, it's all inefficient. It's much more inefficient, like 10 times more efficient to plug in the adapter than to use the magnetic resonant uh, bullshit. Right here, I see light. So I am receiving. Now, how it bounces. Right, now it's going to get dimmer and dimmer. So, the closer it gets, the brighter it gets. The further away it goes, it'll get dimmer. And there's a certain point where it goes out because there's just not enough little bits of energy, little rays hitting it. Because of these walls, I have no idea. That is probably one of the main contributors, but the wall. Right, so he's pointing out how he, he's conceding there's a ton of reflections, and those reflections are in a container. Okay, so they do have residents. Those also have metal in them. So I walk further in, and the light goes out, you may say. Right, so, and it didn't go out, uh, like, over a period of three meters. Like, there was a bright spot, and then a, a less spot, and then a bright spot again. Every three meters, there should be a bright spot. He obviously moved a lot more than three meters. So, you know... It can't. It can't. It's not even the right frequency. I mean, his his walk, like he would give you the distances, right? I mean, if this fit his purpose, he would tell you exactly how far he is because he already did this, right? He already did this in the empty room to figure out where he gets his signal, and what he's really doing is detecting where he's getting a rebound off the roof, off the wall, into the antenna. So he's really just showing you where the rebounds are, where the reflected energy is the strongest. He will be showing you that in a moment. Yeah, it goes out because you are further away from the transmitter. Yeah, but you have to be further away at specific distances. So that's the whole point. These, the, 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 the resonant chamber has nodes. The standing wave means it's standing. That means it's specific distances away is where the signal is supposed to get louder. And so, again, there's no consistency dimensionally. The, the math totally would break if he took a tape measure and measured where the light goes on and off. It wouldn't fit as the right frequency. It wouldn't match. The math wouldn't work. That's a good argument. But if there are standing waves in this room, perhaps it will go back over So he moved a lot more. You can see, he was walking he moved all, the distance he's moved from the transmitter is a lot more than three meters. He took a lot more than three steps, quite obviously. He's moved a lot more than three meters. He should have been, the light goes on at this distance, it should have gone back on again three meters later. <clears throat> and it didn't. And when I'm here, so 
I would like to see it go back on again. If it doesn't want to do that, yeah, there it is. There it is. Okay, so like I said, he's already done this. This is the best he could find. This is the only location he could find where oh, the light goes back on again. So he's he's at least 50 meters, 40 meters from the antenna at least. And he only got to go on and off twice. You know, once, really. That Those are the wrong distances for 88 kilohertz, 3 meters. The, the phase is nowhere close to what it should be mathematically. So it's in a mathematically incorrect location. It's clearly very dim also. <laughs> so it's just a reflection. He's just picking up the reflection off the ceiling. The radio waves are hitting the ceiling, bouncing back down, and hitting that antenna. There it is, because I tested this out, of course, before you came. Right, so he's, he's conceding, he tested it, he obviously didn't measure the distances. He might have measured them, he said they don't fit, so I'm not going to bring that up, because that would just make this experiment look a little bit silly, wouldn't it? Yeah. So that's what I mean by you can engineer something to make it look like something, and it's not. So he made the blackboard look like there's zero energy hitting the black, you know, going through the blackboard. When no, there's a ton of energy going through it, <clears throat> and all you've done is broken your detector. You've essentially disabled your detector by putting it close to a big giant dampening device, <clears throat> sucking, you know, a sucking device. <laughs> However, I describe it, you've destroyed its capacity to function as a detector. And and now he's in a location where he's just picking up reflected energy and it's barely enough but it does light the bulb because there's a little more of it because it's not only getting the direct energy it's getting the reflected energy and it's getting the reflected energy probably a key important point at the right phase it's the right longer distance so the phase is back in phase um, you know this is a simple enough argument um, so the energy is moving through an object uh, Jesus. Right. Um, and it has this phase over time. And the point is, is that it has to arrive at the antenna, okay, with the same cycle, the same blip, 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 blip. The blips have to be on. And so the point is, is by taking a different path and getting to the antenna, the point is, is these blips have the same timing, okay, there. For the reflected point he found, this blips the same time as this does. This hits the antenna, even though it took this longer path, at the same time that one does. So it's not, obviously it's not the same ones at the same, admitted at the same time, they're just admitted at the same frequency. So this one and this one were admitted at the same time. Obviously this one's way, way behind because it's long, traveling a much longer path. But it's on the same frequency as the one that would be coming here, you know, that hasn't been hatched yet it'll end up getting there the same time this one finally gets here and they hit it at the same time and so this has to be on residence this is your if you want to call it a potential standing wave but it's you know it's in a container um, but the point is is that the energy is arriving at the right time um, and that's all he's found is that the distance to the ceiling to the thing that's reflecting you know maybe it's a steel beam up there in the ceiling it's the, just the right distance it causes just the right angle of reflection and it ends up giving you this little extra energy so it's getting it's further away from this so this is getting weaker as you get further away but it's getting now it's at the right location to get this extra energy and that's what's lighting the bulb So there's just there's absolutely no standing waves in the air anywhere. It's moving photons, moving. You see the light again? Can you see it? Just tell them that you see it. Yeah? It's not very strong. We're very far away, but it's clear. This light is substantially brighter than it is here. Yes, because there's out of phase. The reflection off the ceiling from that location is the wrong phase. These things are coming, you know, here, 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 in between. <laughs> it's the wrong phase. You get the right phase when you get the right distance. 
in, when you're measuring a reflection. A reflection has to be the right distance to be to stay on phase with the straight line. So the straight line stuff's coming this way, the other reflected stuff's coming this way, and the only reflections you could detect, the only ones that are constructive, are the ones on phase. And constructive in this case means conducive to your detector detecting them. Because if they're out of phase, they're not going to be as effective in terms of transferring the energy into the antenna. Nothing here, but here it is stronger. There it is. And so there is a huge and incredibly difficult pattern in this room of um, locations where the E fields are very weak. So you see, moved clearly six, seven, eight steps, whatever it was, uh, much more than three meters, and the light goes back on. So it's nowhere near the point, the nodes aren't where they're supposed to be. It's, it's, not a standing wave, he's detecting, he's detecting uh, another effect, a different effect. So he's using this to demonstrate how Maxwell's equations say this, this, and this. Maxwell's equations do have nothing to do with, in this case, these, um, these reflection, or, or I don't even know what you'd call them, these phase, no, it's, it's more like resonance. These resonance arguments are meaningless <coughs> in terms of what these photons are doing. They're not creating standing waves. They're moving from point A to point B. They're moving from the antenna to the other antenna. From the transmitter to the receiver. No standing wave. And where the E fields are very strong, like here, and here is even weaker. I think the most spectacular one is uh, what I did first, and that is to show you that uh, it becomes zero at the blackboard, which is really a very well controlled plane of uh, conductor. So you can hear when he moves it in front of his, his um, so it's another example of just how much these things distort. It's like a metal detector essentially. But you could hear his microphone go funny when he moved the antenna in front of the microphone because the two were becoming entangled. And so when he puts the antenna next to the blackboard he's just saying I'm going to entangle this antenna with that big giant piece of metal. All right, I think I've made the point. Yeah, I think I did. So, <clears throat> so polarization is an interesting subject. Got lots of little pieces to it, and um, uh, I would argue though that this it's it's clear the energy moves from point A to point B. Uh, no need for fields here at all. No need for anything complicated. It's just straight line paths. And you can just detect the straight lines and say it's there or it's not there, and it's it just isn't that complicated. And any um, point where something does change, where you can't receive the energy, it's not because the energy isn't there. <clears throat> it's because it's in a form that can't your detector can't detect, and that's all. You know, you're just changing. You're changing it into something that's not what it needs to be to be detected. It's just that simple. And sometimes you can change it back. Like in light like polarization. Alright. <clears throat> so enough of a video. Um sorry, yeah, this some of this stuff you really have to you have to have some I don't know. I don't know, I think I, I made it simple enough, but yeah, I mean you really have to have some knowledge of some of these subjects that's going in to get it, I think. I don't know. It doesn't seem to me it's, you know, it's not that complicated. <laughs> but anyway, we'll see. Nobody comments on subjects, so I'm just saying it's so clear that nobody who knows anything about this crap uh, you know, is, is listening because there's just no coherent comments on the subject. All right, till next time and such. that's all. Oh, I did want to mention there's a guy who left a comment. Uh, I guess I could go to that. It's not going to kill me. I don't know if I want to get to that subject here. Um, but it's, yeah, here it is. The, I don't know, Dizenbeckoff effect. It's an astronaut guy. <coughs> um, <coughs> and it's really an interesting effect. Um, you know, he, he's, he took a, you know, he's a Russian space guy. He spun 
wing nuts off of a piece of metal and the wing nut flew through space off the metal and it kept flipping this way and it keeps moving and flips the other way and it keeps moving and flips the other way and keeps moving and um, <clears throat> You know, they didn't, it's kind of funny because there's a little conspiracy theory in the, in the fact that Russians didn't announce or release the discovery uh, for 10 years or whatever. They were concerned that the Earth might do the same thing. Uh, and I don't know why they would keep that a secret. <laughs> you know, I guess they wanted to take advantage of it. If the Earth did flip, they wanted to be the first to know. I don't know. It just seemed kind of funny. Um, but anyway, uh, so yes, I'll get to that. Uh, but to me, that's the argument's going to come down to the same ones that run gyroscopes and, and wheels with torque. And, you know, the the Bill Gates guy was talking about some of that stuff, you know, with a skater with their arms in, and he's saying a particle theory can't explain. Yeah, sure it can. Uh, velocity means you're gaining velocity. That means you want to leave an orbit. That's why the arms go out is because something has to pull you in. So if there's no gravity pulling it in, then you have to do it with your muscles. You know, you have to apply a force to keep your arms in. Um, you don't have to apply any force to have your arms fly out. So if you let your arms relax, they'll fly out. You know, not, not a big deal. Not complicated. Um, there's no gravity. You know, your body doesn't produce enough gravity to pull your arms in. So obviously you have to do it uh, with muscles. You have to expend energy to do it. Uh, but the idea is simple. is that you're just giving the it's like giving the, the Earth more velocity. You give the Earth more velocity, it's going to fly out into a bigger orbit. It won't be in orbit anymore, maybe. Um, <laughs> you know, you'll just leave town. Um, and that's what your arms want to do, right? They want to go out. They want to leave town. But they're attached, so there's a force eventually shows up, and the force is, is the tension between the atoms. Uh, you know, between the the adhesion between the protons and the electrons and the protons and the electrons and the protons and the electrons. That adhesion is what's holding your arms from taking off eventually. Um, but anyway, uh, but yeah, so it, it just gets into this idea that if you see this motion, right, there's got to be a friction somewhere and the friction is somewhere on the inside because there's conflicts in the velocities. and somewhere you've got to fix that so in the wheel example the wheel spins on a on a center and there's going to be friction because of gravity in one direction and that means this is going to move in the opposite direction your your axle will move in the opposite direction of the rotation okay because <coughs> there's more friction on one side of the axle than there is on the other side of the axle the opposite the width of the direction of the motion yeah well, anyway, it doesn't matter which one. I'm just saying, so you can understand that it has to do with getting to the center. And the same argument, I guess, is what I'm saying here is when you go to flip something, the idea is you flip it and it rotates this way, 180 degrees. Um, but I think that's only really true with flat subjects. Things that are like this, this will do that. Okay, so it did a rotation as I flipped it. It rotated, okay, this way. I didn't want it to go that way. Okay, black to, you know, blue. And they sort of make the argument that it does that all the time. Well, it doesn't really. If you flip it perfectly, it'll be okay. It won't flip. <clears throat> it won't do this turn. Okay, but the odds are you're going to flip it with a bias. And the bias is creating a procession inside. And the procession eventually flips it. So, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I'll go into it in more depth, but uh, you know, it's. I'm just saying that it's <coughs> obviously there's a reason these things happen. It's not you know beyond our capacity to understand. Um, but the point is, is it's kind of a dramatic effect in the sense that it flips very fast. So it it has a wobble, but it can't wobble this way. It wobbles and then it there's a tipping point. It just tips, and that's the interesting part. So anyway. Till the next time and such. I just wanted to say, yeah, I read, I just didn't get to it, sorry. I forgot. Uh, so, till next time and such.